and uh, so we'll kick off. Um, my name is uh, Patrick Dunleavy. I'm uh, Emeritus Professor of uh, Politics, Political Science and Public Policy at the LSE. And I'm also the um, Editor-in-Chief of LSE Press, which is our new open access press. And I'm um, uh, joined here by uh, Tim Monteith, who's um, a lecturer in data visualization and human geography at University College London, and is also uh, a Civica researcher at LSE uh, in open science. And so what we're talking about today is the first part of a series of seminars that are about um, what I saw a, a recent article describe as easing into open science and particularly easing into open science for the social sciences. So this is the first of a series of seminars that we're giving aimed at researchers and not at um, uh, librarians or uh, research project managers, although they're very welcome to come. But the difficulty that uh, a lot of researchers have with open science in the social sciences is that it needs quite a lot of adaptation um, to decide how, how to do that in, in our kinds of disciplines. So what we're doing is producing an open social science handbook and we're recording all the um, sessions uh, with a view to, um, you know, exploiting your expertise and your questions. So what's going to happen is that I'm going to basically take the first half of the presentation, um, thinking about the uh, more um, philosophical and research fundamental kind of aspects of documenting research as you go along. Because all of us, I'm sure, <laughs> feel that we're not as good at documenting research as we should be. And all of us tend to think this is a sort of personal failing, which is, is not true. There are various structural reasons why it's quite hard to do documenting research as you go along. Um, so I'm just going to run over those to begin with. And then Tim is going to take the second half of the talk and run through some very specific and hopefully helpful suggestions for how you can do better at documenting research. So, Tim, we might move to the second slide. Um, this forms part of a, an overall movement, which is very big now in STEM sciences and is shifting also into the social sciences, which is called, some people call it open science, some people call it open research to make sure that it doesn't just refer to the STEM period. And here is a, uh, a slide produced by UNESCO uh, very recently at a conference in York that shows all the various different bits of uh, the open research agenda and um, all the many components that sit within each of those bits. And the bits that we're particularly concerned about are the column headed research, uh, res reproducible research because um, this is a very important element of open social science basically improving the kind of show and tell quality of how we've done the research. Now, of course, we've always had methodology sections and so on in, in articles, but they are usually incredibly hard boiled and uh, very uh, difficult to access for outside uh, viewers. You can look at methodology sections and um, even after very skillful reviewers have probed, there's still a lot that's left unsaid. And uh, so reproducible research is a very important part of open science. And then also this feeds through into things like fair data and open infrastructure where we're depositing um, data sets and uh, archival material so that other people can have a chance of reusing it. And increasingly now journals are requiring people to produce um, what are called replication ar 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 archives or replication 
uh, annexes. Um, it's not strictly the right label, but, but uh, the essential point is you have to go considerably beyond previous ways of documenting your research in order to get it published. And so that can be uh, quite a, a late stage or crisis uh, phenomenon for people when they, they get to reviews and they get to submissions to journals and realize that they haven't fully documented what they did. So those are the bits of, of the very large landscape that this particularly refers to. And the whole effort will be, I think, Next slide, Tim. Um, the um, uh, whole emphasis will be on um, trying to develop good quality um, practices. Now, here's a study done by Christensen et al. in 2020, where they surveyed um, American social scientists about whether they'd posted any data or code online, whether they posted study instruments online, by which they mean survey, coding, books, and, and so on, um, maybe um, code online, and whether they pre-registered hypotheses or analyses. And the black line shows the, the proportion of people who said that they'd done at least one of these things. And you can see that, um, uh, open science, social science practices are most developed um, in the experimental social sciences. Um, the, in what the Christensen and Co. classed as quantitative non-experimental social sciences, there's also a big growth of posting data or code online uh, and a somewhat slower growth of posting study instruments online. And finally, if we look at qualitative or theoretical work, everything is a lot uh, less developed, but it is still nonetheless growing uh, appreciably over time. So open social science practices are um, with us now. They're very important for early career researchers and PhD students and so on, because standards of, what, of disclosure are increasing over time. And essentially what we're trying to do in open social science is increase transparency. And I thought I would show you this picture of trans, uh, transparent uh, organizing boxes. And I know from my own experience in my wonderfully disorganized garage, that uh, just a simple thing like moving from boxes that are opaque to boxes that are clear cut, which actually uh, a technique developed in lean manufacturing so you can see what's in the box without having to open it. That in itself is a small scale thing. You do it at the early stage in, in creating a storage and, and yet because it's transparent you can see very clearly um, what's inside. Um, and that's what we're really talking about here. We're, arguing that technical changes made early on can help you get better organized. They particularly can help with overcoming the initial problem, which is called a transaction cost file. And a transaction cost file just means that um, somebody thinks about, well, should I document my research at this point? And then they think, oh no, but it's lunchtime and I've got to go and do something else, or um, I haven't got the time. And so they don't document it. And then six weeks later, they can't remember what they did. Or at least if it's me, it's probably about three weeks later, I can't remember what I did. Um, and uh, that's linked to the kind of mastery at the time syndrome, which means that when you've made a decision and you're just doing something, you're right on top of it and you feel that it's very obvious. And the problem about that is that you think, well, I'll always know or remember this, and so I won't document it, and then you don't. So recording more is vital for strengthening research integrity, and showing more is vital for um, uh, later on when you come back to look at things. So, you, you know, you then have, because it's a transparent box you're using instead of an opaque box, you can more easily search for exactly the material you want. You can you have more chance of remembering 
when and where you did things and also you avoid the very considerable what some people call rummage costs, <laughs> costs that involve disturbing archives and uh, that you know actually are relevant and that uh, uh, create um, difficulties, possibly disorganization in your systems. So moving on to the next slide, um, let's just give an example of the importance of clear documentation. So um, Reinhardt and Rogoff are two very, very famous uh, Harvard economists who uh, around about the 2008 uh, uh, financial crisis produced an article called Growth in a Time of Debt that was immensely influential in very many countries because it argued that when debt passed 90% of GDP, the countries involved all suffered lower economic growth, which in the, in the article was estimated at minus 0.1%. Now, there's a great story about a MSc student at the University of New England, whose name was Thomas Herndon, and he had been assigned you know, a weekly task for his uh, MSc in economics, which was a, an exercise where you had to critique um, a, a famous article. So he picked growth in a time of debt and um, tried to work out what was going on in the article and uh, became quite puzzled about uh, how the authors had reached the conclusions that they did. So he wrote to them at Harvard and asked to see the, uh, to see, get a copy of the original data to see if he could rerun the analysis that they had undertaken. And uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff were incredibly evasive and didn't send the data for a, a very long time. And in fact, only sent it when his supervisor and another colleague in the university joined in with the request. Um, and when they got the data, uh, which was used, it was um, mainly done in Excel and had lots and lots of problematic Excel mistakes, simple mistakes which are quite easy to make in Excel and uh, an absence of check rows and, and so forth. Plus the authors in conducting their analysis had apparently made various ad hoc exclusions from the data of you know, leaving out this country or that country um, uh, without any clear rationale being apparent. So Herndon and his two um, uh, academic professors uh, then uh, published a critique where they argued that uh, GDP growth in the high debt countries was a very respectable 2.2%. And so I think that whether we think Reinhardt and Rogoff are right or whether we think um, Herndon and co were right, and most people I think think Herndon and co are right, it does show the importance of careful external scrutiny, not just of what's written in a methodology section of the article, but what the authors have actually done in terms of um, the analysis. And uh, particularly, can you replicate a result that uh, somebody has achieved? So that's really something we need to think about for your own work. And it's not going to be a problem that's easy to solve. So one of the reasons why it's not easy to solve is that there's a, a distinction between explicit knowledge, which is consciously known and formally processed and where we critically examine it, we all go over our methodology statements and so on. And lots and lots of what's called implicit or tacit knowledge, which is usually um, ways of doing things that we've been socialized into or we developed over time in coping with various uh, academic or research problems. It's informal learning, it's the conducting of pre-scientific tasks it's quite hard to identify uh, often which of uh, where you're, you're uh, using implicit or tacit knowledge. And in STEM sciences, there's been a lot of work on how this operates. And it shows that uh, if the people in one laboratory need to learn a technique from another laboratory, the only way that works is for a staff member to go and sit for weeks or months uh, or days, depends how complex the thing is and how new it is to really understand what lab B is doing. Otherwise you make a mess. And um, certainly you can never really understand 
one lab can never understand what's going on in another lab unless they do a face-to-face -face visit and see processes in action. So replicability is not an easy thing to achieve between labs and even in very developed parts of the STEM science uh, area, the physical and technical sciences. And also non-replicability doesn't necessarily mean that research is bad or flawed or that something has unethical has been going on. But uh, the problem of explicit and implicit knowledge is always with us. Moving on. Uh, we can also see a problem that's perhaps more specific for the social sciences, which was uh, very well set out by Charles Lindblom and David Cohen in their book, Usable Knowledge. And they argued uh, quite controversially that the idea that you would ever get to a whole social science, let's say a whole economics, which is professionally validated in a scientific manner, that's to say where all the knowledge being used is explicit knowledge that's been tested and found useful, um, is never going to happen in social sciences. So we have, you know, sections of knowledge which are PSI validated, professional social inquiry validated, but they're usually quite small islands, possibly even pinpricks located within a big canvas where we interconnect from one area to another and we make sense of and give meaning to things um, using other kinds of knowledge, another kind of knowledge that they called ordinary knowledge. Now, ordinary knowledge doesn't necessarily mean that it's common sense or anything like that, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's less good knowledge but it's just not scientifically validated. So it can be very complex, it can be very expert, it can be very esoteric. Uh, and it's always, in their view, going to provide a context within which we make sense of the small bits of professional uh, social science that we can uh, uh, see. And there are some arguments around that. Humans can always update their behavior so that if you say this is how something works people can step back and say well we've taken that knowledge on board and now we're going to do something different and similarly social situations and technology are constantly changing so there may not be uh, an easy way of uh, reconciling um, the need to be explicit with with this because ordinary knowledge tends to stay more implicit. Next slide. Um, the second sort of dimension of this is around about the craft of research. So in a very interesting book, Richard Sennett, the famous sociology called The Craftsman, argued essentially that making is thinking. And craft knowledge is something that uses general purpose tools. It's complex, they adapted to tasks and situations. It's vocationally learned through years of experience, repetition and personal refinement. And it is very often implicit knowledge. Now, I should say here that actually that uh, craft knowledge can now be transferred quite easily person to person. Uh, so you can go and sit next to a, a craftsman and be apprenticed to them. And, and, and that's the traditional way in which it, it was transferred. Um, and now, of course, with YouTube, uh, and YouTube videos, all kinds of relatively esoteric craft knowledge has been, uh, you know, successfully transferred across uh, lots of uh, different people. So it doesn't, you know, what's craft and, and what cannot be formalized or, or made more explicit or made more transparent about craft knowledge changes over time. but um, and, and, and more and more craft knowledge tends to be systematized. And that's occurred particularly in academic uh, research. So over time, the standards of academic rigor have risen very fast. And that's having a big impact now on today's PhD students, uh, early career uh, researchers, and their advisors, who on the whole are having to do things a lot more rigorously than you know, 
old timers like me did it in the old days. Um, so moving on. Um, one solution to to the uh, whole problem of how you well one important solution which is available to you if you're working in a stem science lab particularly one that's got you know ongoing funding and has been going for a long period of time and can look forward to keeping that funding going in the future is uh, the device advice known as lab handbooks where people have tried consistently over time to write down tacit knowledge um, to write down uh, the results of socialization to write down what people have learned by seeing and chatting and imitating and trial and error um, and of course collective tacit knowledge is massive in any team context so inter team member consistency and practice is vital we've all studied the problem of intercoder reliability in surveys uh, but that's you know that it applies all over the all over the procedures that are used in stem science labs and it applies a lot uh, in all kinds of social science contexts such as for example coding up qualitative materials and there's a recurring problem that uh, you know computer programmers of lamented for years of under documentation at the time due to uh, you know this mastery syndrome that, that people have uh, due to a lack of awareness or empathy of with with other people's understanding what other people's understanding is where people might have problems and also of course because transaction costs grow in team contexts so if i have to spend time you know, time out from doing new things in order to document what's been done already, that will be of value to other members of the team, but it may not, it may mean that my completion of tasks gets delayed and, and put back. So in STEM science lab handbooks are very well developed and they condense out key protocols and craft behaviors covering all aspects of what the lab is doing, especially the sort of pre-scientific aspects. Um, and Tim is going to describe various uh, bits and uh, parts of, of, of what's usually covered in lab handbooks. Research team or lab handbooks are, are not so common in the social sciences, but they are a, in steadily increasing. And um, they're steadily increasing for a very good reason, which brings me to my last slide. Um, namely that the number of authors for papers in the social sciences has grown appreciably um, in the last few years is, is now sort of uh, um, around about three uh, for uh, uh, all papers. And um, for highly indexed, uh, highly impact papers, these are the ones shown in, in, in the black line um, and they are consistently more multi-authored in the social sciences than uh, the average. And that difference is very big. It's also growing very big in social, in the STEM science, of course, where you can have five and a half thousand alleged authors on a, a single journal article. Uh, meanwhile, over in arts and humanities, um, number of authors is, is sort of only very gradually and glacially increasing. But particularly for the social sciences, team handbooks are going to be more and more important and project handbooks and agreements project documentation is going to be more important because you've got more authors involved and at that point i think we can pause for a little while and see if we have any queries or questions if you've got any questions you can put them in the chat or if anybody would like to ask a question, uh, I don't know, Tim might be able to uh, find you and, and put you on, on camera. Yes, if, any, if anyone wants to ask a question, um, you should be able to just unmute yourself um, and speak up. Um, or also, yes, if you write in the chat box, I will, I'll be able to read that out for everyone too. 
it's incredibly helpful for us if you do ask questions uh, because uh, it, uh, it's a constructive thing to do. So we're not going to be annoyed or anything about it. Uh, we'll also have um, time for questions at the end if anyone wants to, to think it through a yeah, little bit we, more. We, yeah. <laughs> well, perhaps it's just a bit too philosophical so far. Uh, and at this point, I'm going to hand over to Tim and he's going to take us through some more practice orientated things. Right. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, yeah, and I wanted to pick up exactly where you left off. That I think in the social sciences, um, we're in a stage of kind of a mix between um, thinking of yourself as an individual researcher and thinking of yourself as part of a team. Um, unlike the STEM sciences, it's relatively rare still in the social sciences to have big funding grants for labs of continuous funding, um, you know, for over decades that allow the development of lab handbooks and standardised protocols. But we are in a phase where working in a small to medium sized team over maybe three to five years is now quite a common phenomena. Um, so as a researcher, um, you're not going to be thinking of yourself purely as a sole author, but as part of a small team, but that that team may be changing every couple of years or, or varying throughout your research career. So kind of want to be thinking about documenting your research and kind of your research practices, both in terms of yourself, um, and, and developing your own archive and own ways of doing things, but also constantly thinking about how that fits in with other researchers and other research projects. Because, you know, as teams become more common, as multi-author papers become more common, um, sharing these things will become a big part of the research process itself, um, but one, not one that you can necessarily rely on completely throughout your research career. So there needs to be a, a flexibility developed there. So thinking in terms of documenting your research as a craft knowledge, there are a few things that I really want to stress. The first one is that there's no correct way to document your research. Um, how you document your research is about developing a system that works for you um, and works for how you research, how you think, what it is that you're doing. Um, there's no set guidelines to follow. It's a matter of trial and error and refinement until you come to a system that you're happy with. Um, and, you know, the, as a craft, this is often something that's an, an aesthetic judgment or a judgment that you make as a researcher rather than something in which there is an objective scientific best practice that needs to be followed. So I think thinking of that uh, in terms of craft knowledge and um, that, that is cultivated and developed over time um, is a really useful metaphor. The second thing I wanted to say up front is, is, is a disclaimer. Um, as we develop open social science and kind of learn from lessons in STEM, um, often what we're talking about the examples can get very technical very quickly um, but developing these skills developing ways to document your research doesn't need to be technical um, the fact that it's more technical doesn't mean that it's better um, it's about finding a tool that works for you and fits into your research flow and that could be keeping things as simple as possible or it could be adopt adopting some of these more complex tools um from the stem sciences because they fit your workflow or they fit what you're doing the thing to really bear in mind is what you want to do is minimize the transaction cost of documenting your research as patrick said earlier the smaller the transaction cost um, in terms of getting some documentation down keeping a log of what you've done recording and developing an archive the more likely you are to do it um, because it's all very fair and well to plan out a, a big comprehensive system that's going to cover everything you do but if it feels onerous and like it's taking too much time you're not going to do it and then you're going to end up not documenting anything at all um, and potentially you know get yourself in a pickle with that later on 
So in terms of developing your research or uh, documenting your research as you go on, I think it's very helpful to think of it as creating your own personal research archive or infrastructure as a system that helps you as a researcher um, throughout your research career um, and throughout all the different things that you may be doing. And I think it's really helpful to stand back and think big picture on this. You know, if you're an early career researcher starting out now um, and you're hoping to have a, a research career that lasts you know, several decades, um, even if you're not a computer intensive researcher, that could add up to tens of thousands of project files um, that you've, you've used and developed over that time. Um, and without a, a system in place to kind of organize that or archive it, um, it can become incredibly overwhelming. Similarly, even if we're just thinking in terms, not of a whole career, but of a, a single project, from conception to the publication of that project could be a several year long process. So, you know, keeping everything in your mind or being able to remember what you did when you started out um, isn't realistic. And you're going to need to return to work that you've done previously and being able to find old drafts, old figures, old data, um, maybe run additional analysis on them, corrections for papers, additional information for reviewers um, is, is something that's going to come up over and over again. And you want this to be something that's not a burden. It's easy to do. Um, and certainly not that you've lost the files and that you can't go back and do those things, um, which, you know, really is a, is a huge hindrance to your own research and to the, you know, the transparency and move towards an open science framework. <coughs> so going through some of the, the more technical aspects um, I'll be talking about in a second, I think there are five key questions to think about in terms of developing your own system for documenting research. The first one is, will you be able to access your data in the future? Um, will you be able to understand what you've done? Are the programs you're using have long-term support? Will you be able to access them if you change institution? If you're between um, jobs as an early career researcher, you, you might well might be, um, will you still be able to access some of those state programs or will you have to pay to use them? Um, because these things can be real impediments that can lock you out of your own research. And finally, can it be shared with other researchers? Now, in answer to these questions, there's no one particular program um, to advocate for or one particular way of doing things. But I think if you're thinking through these questions um, and trying to address them in your own way, you're often going to be end up steering towards um, things that are already within an open science framework or part of open source software, um, which, as I'll get to later, um, can help with open access and things later, but also help you um, and make your research workflow easier and you know to be able to retain access to your files and access to the research that you've done. So I think the fundamental thing to start with is a research journal. And this is very much the craft uh, of research, keeping track of what you're doing while you're doing it. So I think there are four things to highlight here. The first one is paper journals. Um, I don't think they're going anywhere. Um, I do so much work on my computer, but I still have a notebook to write things down in, to take to meetings. Um, and, you know, many researchers find that writing things down by hand works for them um, in terms of developing ideas and so on. And I don't want to advocate getting rid of paper journals at all. I think they have their place. Um, but again, think through some of the, these questions there. Um, do you have specific notebooks for specific projects? Are you putting down dates so you can go back and check when you did things um, and cross-reference them? Um, and furthermore, is this fitting into a wider system of keeping notes or keeping track of what you've done? For example, um, a computerized um, journal or, or file system, for example, um, an example here that I use, um, keeping track uh, of kind of minutes of meetings or records of why I've chosen certain data sets and kind of the process going into it that I can go back and check later for other things. Um, and that, you know, 
match it, matching with paper notebooks that I've, I've taken notes in at the time. Another thing to think about, if particularly if you're kind of a quantitative researcher, is computerized lab notebooks like Jupyter notebooks, and they're very popular in the STEM sciences, um, which allow you to move or keep the record um, cell by cell. We can see here of each line of things that you're testing, so you can go back through and see all the things that you did and um, building up in your analysis. So, for example, here checking is this variable missing? Okay, why is it missing? And doing all those things so i can go back and look at this um and it's in a nice linear order um so that i can look at what i've done i can remember why i've done it i can leave myself notes um as to how i arrived at the later analysis that i conducted <coughs> another thing i think that's really important or a really good way of documenting the research and what you're doing is uh, reference managers so here's an example from my Zotro um, where I keep a record and notes um, on all the articles that I've been reading um, and it does this automatically for me um, and then I can add them into papers later but one of the things that I find most useful is that it keeps a track of when I've read that article um, so I can think ah okay I need this article oh when did I do that oh it was after teaching finished I could scroll back and have a look what I was reading that month and find what I wanted very easily. And that's all there recorded um, with a very low transaction cost to me. Um, but similarly, thinking in terms of open science and being able to access your records, Zotro is an open source program. Um, it's free to use. Um, I can back up all the PDFs on my computer um, and I will be able to have access to this um for the rest of my research career um i can easily share folders with other members of my research team if they want to to look at what i've been reading um and you know you can contrast this to proprietary reference managers um that are often owned by the big publishers that say if you lose your institutional access or you don't pay a subscription fee to them you can be locked out um of all your reading and all your notes um and i think you know that can be a real problem to researchers that have have invested time and effort into that and suddenly it's gone um you know it, it can be a real hindrance to to your research workflow so another thing to think of that's very practical um but i think it's really really important if we're thinking of <coughs> how are you managing your data in a way that works for you is file naming and, and making backups um so if I think the thing to think of here is if you can no longer find or use the research you've done previously, say years ago, um, you've lost that knowledge. Um, yes, Andreas, um, you've got a question. Do you want to chip in? Yeah, I, I sorry, I just wanted to, to like point out that using um, uh, Dropbox, for instance, might be an issue depending on what what you put in Dropbox, of course, but. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're essentially signing your ownership of whatever you put there away to Dropbox so they can basically do whatever they want most of the time with what with what you put there. So you should be very, very careful at what you put yeah. there. Uh, yeah. as well as as well as if you are within the the borders of the European Union, you should definitely not put stuff containing personal data in something that has servers outside of the European Union, because then you're violating EU regulations. Yes, thank, uh, thank you very so... much. That's a very helpful comment. Um, that's something that I, I haven't addressed in this talk. Um, there are solutions there, um, for example, own cloud or, or OneDrive. Um, I think that's also something to be thinking of in terms of data management plans. And um, if you're working with sensitive data or, or data that's copyrighted, um, as you say, thinking in, in terms of um, data regulation there um, to make sure that you're complying um, with all the, the relevant laws. Um, what I'm thinking of particularly here is in, in terms of your code or your analysis, your notes, um, your readings, um, but that's a very useful point. And I think uh, we will be running a future session on, on data management plans um, for research. And I think that's an issue that we will cover then as well. <clears throat> so um, just to carry on in terms of naming files, um, I've got 
two examples of how to do it here. Um, one from me and one from Patrick. Um, so I, how I do it is I like to think of um, all of my files as like a, a library. Um, and I have this numbering system that I use where I sort everything into separate folders, depending on the project with subfolders within them, and then a separate number that goes up for each new file. So it has a way where I can find exactly what I'm looking for straight away. And then I can see everything that I've done in the order that I've done it. Um, this is a very hierarchical um, and very rigid organizing system. I find that it works for me. I also think something like this can be very useful if you're a qualitative researcher, um, particularly if you're using things like archival data. Um, you end up with like thousands of photographs of things that you've, you've seen in the archive, um, and you can recreate your own little archive with a similar, similar filing system um, that allows you to, to navigate um, what you've done and, and your documentation very easily. Another system is to think of your file system like a search engine. Um, which is what Patrick does, um, which is to make sure you have long descriptions of what's in each file, that there's a versioning system that you can easily navigate so that you can search for what you want and it will come up with it immediately because you, you're putting all the information that you need in, <coughs> in the heading. Um, and again, there's no one correct way to do this, but it's something to think about and think, okay, how am I gonna be able to find my files in the future? Am I going to be able to sort through all the different things I want? Um, because, you know, developing a handbook or writing an article, um, you can go through 20 or 30 iterations quite easily with co-authors. Um, and I have made the mistake before of editing and sending back one that was two or three weeks old. Um, and, you know, you've essentially wasted days of work there. Um, and having a file system in place, um, make sure that you don't make mistakes like that, even if it's, you know, a year, two years down the line. Um, and I think just thinking some of these through and coming up with, okay, what would work for me um, can really reduce that transaction cost and really help you as a researcher develop a system that works for you and that makes documenting things easy. Um, another highly technical point here, but I think one um, is really worth stressing for anyone that does qualita qualitative research where you're coding or quantitative research um, is really think about variable names. Um, and documenting them as you go. Again, it's one of those things that it's very easy to think that you'll remember forever, um, but you really don't. Um, and that coming back to later, you can really have to spend a lot of time working out what you've done. Similarly, if you're sharing this with other researchers, um, even in your team or outside of it, um, having a document that you can send them that explains what the variables are, how you've come to them, um, is incredibly, incredibly helpful. Um, statistical software like Stata and SPSS can produce um, documentation files that make this somewhat easier. Um, other things like Python and R, you can comment and explain your code, um, which I think is really, really vital, um, but you have to remember to do it um, and, and build this in at the time. Um, I think the example Patrick gave earlier should really try and warn people off Excel. And one of the reasons why I think there's a huge problem with Excel for open social science research is that there is no way to easily document these changes. There's no way to easily see what was done in what order. Um, the formulas uh, and the calculations that are done are disguised um, and it can lead to mistakes um, that trip you up. Or um, even if they're not tripping you up, it can be very hard to understand when you go back to do them in the future. Um, a quick note on, on commenting your code. Um, make comments that are useful to yourself. Um, so here, this is something I did when I was starting out with my PhD, and I wrote some comments to myself thinking, yep, that's what you do, um, but they're completely unusable. Um, this code is a mess. Taking this out messes everything up. Okay, great. That's really not helpful at all. Um, I had to go back to this um, to update a graph um, near when I was publishing my thesis, and this cost me like several days trying to figure out what I'd done and why I'd done it. Um, and, you know, having a, a documentation system in place um, and, and thinking through, okay, you know, what will help me in the future? What will help if I have to share this with other researchers? Um, would I be comfortable open accessing this code? Um, no, I wouldn't. Um, 
but something like this that I write now, where I've left long comments about what each bit of code's doing, um, that I think is clear to other researchers, I'm, I'm happy to share and go back to it and read through it and figure out what I've done immediately. <clears throat> Again, this is getting towards the more advanced computational end of things, but using tools like GitHub um, can have a real payoff um, if you're working with highly complex pieces of code or with multiple authors. Um, it's a steep learning curve, but I think for some people it will be very useful. Um, and this is something that's used a lot in terms of developing open source software and in the STEM sciences. So I think here it's terms of thinking like, what do I need for my research? What's useful? Um, of course, you know, if you're a qualitative researcher using an archive, um, using something like GitHub won't be very useful to you at all. Um, but having an organized file system um, where you can navigate it as if you're navigating the archive will be. Similarly, if you're doing highly computational work, maybe you don't need such an organized file system, but using something like GitHub um, will be doing lots of that work for you and recording every step of what you're doing. So you can go back and move through it later or open access that, that data as you want in the future. And finally, just thinking again in terms of advanced searches, um, thinking in terms of how do I record this for the future? How can I pass it on to other researchers? Um, I think the digital humanities and people doing systematic reviews um, are really onto something here in terms of documenting how searches were done, how what they picked out was picked out for a reason, and archiving. Um, say all the papers or the documents that the search retrieved and then how they've sorted them and the decisions they've sorted them. Um, and I, I think that's something that people could look into or you know maybe social science as a whole could learn more from. <clears throat> so one of the things you'll notice is that during that talk I haven't talked about open social science specifically very much. I think the first thing to think here is in terms of documenting your research is about creating a system that works for you. And I think if you're answering those questions that I, I set up at the start, it's going to be steering you towards things that have already been developed by the open science community or open source community. Um, that then means it can be very easy for you to share your research process with other members of your team or to be opened up open access as you want, say when you're publishing the results. Um, the, the real thing to think about here is in terms of reducing the transaction cost in moving things towards open access, towards open science. If you've been doing all these things in developing your own process, documenting what you've been doing as you're going, it's very easy then to, to turn that into open data and to provide this alongside an article. I'm opening up that way rather than having to go around with a huge cost um, and maybe do that all again or <clears throat> rewrite some of your code, try and re-understand everything um, before an article comes out. Um, the idea here is to make things as easy as possible for you as a researcher um, and in doing so for that to further open science. Um, as and when you want to engage with it. So just a few resources here for people to look at um, after our talk. Um, Zotero as a reference manager is something I would really highly recommend to everyone to use if you're not using it already. Um, Jupyter Notebooks are the computational lab notebooks, which I think are very, very good for anyone that's doing any kind of quantitative work. Um, and you can also use languages like R with them. Um, and finally, um, A Plain Person's Guide to Plain Text Social Science is a book written by Professor of Sociology, Kieran Healy, um, that I found personally very influential and very, very helpful. Um, I will warn people that it does get quite technical quite quickly, um, but I think it's useful for many people to read and to have a look through and think of and pick out what works for them. Um, it's not a recipe guide that you have to follow every part of, um, but just think, okay, would this be useful to me? Are there some elements here that I could adapt in my own research process? Um, and how would that work? <clears throat>
So thank you very much for everyone for listening. And I think we've got 10 minutes now for questions if you if you would like to ask anything to me or Patrick. Yes, maybe I have a quick question. You know, it's very interesting. Thank you very much for uh, what you've been saying. So, um, so to put the two things together, in a sense, you know, uh, where are we in terms of having common formats so that uh, it's easy not only for a research team to understand the, the process, but also for other researchers to reconstruct. So, in terms of, I think there is a need for some standards to some extent. You know, if we want to have really open. Uh, research, you know, it's, I fully understand that me as a scholar, I uh, was mostly interested in how I can be better organized, and I mm -hmm. learned some tricks here. Uh, but the key is also how to make uh, my process understandable for other researchers outside the team. I would need to coordinate and try to develop some mm -hmm. common standards. That's the question. Yes, so I think um, common standards can be discipline specific here. Um, for example, stat is still widespread in economics, but isn't used so much in other fields. Um, and I think, you know, we already do have some common standards in the social sciences. For example, I think the word document is pretty much a common standard for everyone. Um, whether these are necessarily the best tools to use is another question. Um, personally, I think things like markdown documents um, or even LaTeX are very, very helpful um sharing writing and sharing notes with each other um but i understand that that's not best for everyone um so it's a matter or you know maybe maybe too technical for some people um so it's a matter of finding what works for you and your research team um in terms of data files i think things like csvs are very widespread now and very usable um but again that's often for kind of flat, um, relatively simple data. Um, so I think it, it, it's still discipline specific. I think we can be moving towards more common standards. Um, but one of the things I, I didn't want to do in this talk was, was get bogged down into kind of file format standardization, very technical things there. Um, and really kind of ask people okay what works for you if what works for you is having everything in a word document i'm not here um to tell you that that's wrong um i just want you to be thinking about how um that's going to develop and how you're going to make use of that in the future um but obviously you know if you really hate word documents and you want to, to explore other options then you know I, I would encourage you to do so and find something that works for you there um and there are also, you know, tools out there like Pandoc um, that make converting things between, say, LaTeX and Word documents very, very easy. Um, so that, you know, if if you're developing um, things for your workflow, you can also move it back into, you know, Word documents or something like that. That might be um, better for the rest of your research team. Um, Andreas, um, you have a question. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that there is a, um, a coordinating agency in Sweden that it, that has a, a repository based on a standard uh, specified by something called the DDI Alliance, which I posted a, a link to. Mm -hmm. So there are some uh, high level initiatives uh, regarding standardizing um, metadata as, as much as possible, but of course it's also very discipline specific so mm -hmm. uh but you can look at the the link and see if you have any use with if you want to thank you very much um yes and i believe we will make the slides available after the talk as well um maximilian cool hi thanks very inspiring talk i would just want to come back because i'm a very early career phd researcher i would just want to come back to what what you were just 
talking about um, and you, you you mentioned that LaTeX or Markdown could be very useful and handy tools and that's also what I kind of use throughout my masters but now in the PhD when it comes to working together with all other social scientists I'm in the organizational theory field they are all mostly used to working in 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 work docs and I'm I'm I have kind of kind of dropped all my nice kind of um um processes and workflows from before because I was just so like I was like it doesn't really make sense if I constantly have to, to uh, convert stuff back and forth to to uh, to word doc so I was wondering what's your what's how how do you deal with this basically and and do you use one system privately and the other one more to work with other people or how do you how do you deal with that yeah that's a good question um and I think I was similar um Oh, I've encountered similar things. Um, I think what I do is I I like to think about reducing the transaction cost. Um, so if it's something that I'm writing for myself, like notes, um, I'll often just use a markdown document um, and, and keep all my notes that way. Um, if it's authoring a, a journal article um, as part of a team um, and everyone else is using a Word document, um, just join in on that. Um, there's no need to be stubborn it's about making things as easy as possible for you and for other people um i think word documents are a little bit of an odd one um just in terms of i think it is a shared standard for most people writing in the social sciences um but it isn't really an open format um it is you know something you have to pay for um but i think it, it's so widespread it's not really um the hill you want to die on um as an open social science researcher, um, you know, I think it, it's inevitable that you have to use Word documents um, and it's not too much of an issue. Um, Maybe I could also add as a publisher here that working with LaTeX documents is incredibly difficult in publishing. And, uh, you know, please don't send us LaTeX documents uh, unless you're dealing with, a, 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 let's say, an economics journal or something like that, which is very used to handling them. Mm -hmm. um, on the whole, it's, it, it's, it's a more difficult thing to, to, to get published. And, you know, we prefer to see stuff in Word because we've, we've got a lot of uh, software that's very adapted to, to COVID. Yeah. I would also um, really like to add here, I'll put it in chat, um, there's a piece of software called Pandoc, um, which is used for converting between various different types of text documents. And it's very, very good at converting things between LaTeX and Word documents. Um, so that's one thing to use. Um, certainly I used it in that I wrote my thesis in LaTeX um, because I found it much easier to, to manage all my references that way. Um, but when I sent it to my supervisor, I just ran it through Pandoc and it turned it into a Word document, um, maintaining all the formatting that I had, um, all my captions, images, um, and automatically converting all of my references as well. Um, so I think there are there are ways around it here um, and ways to do it. Um, and you know, maybe maybe that that would work for you, it'd be easier for you. Um, but again, um, I don't think there's a need for kind of um, an ideological purity for making sure that everything is open or open source or open access, um, but to really be pragmatic about what's working for me as a researcher, um, both in terms of fitting into research teams um, and over a longer duration of my research career. I think we're sort of moving towards the end of our slot. So many thanks indeed to Maximilian and Andreas and everybody else who's asked a question that's been incredibly helpful. We are going to uh, have another session on uh, 10th of November, where we're going to be discussing reusing and repurposing and mashing up other people's data, which is a, a big problem in the social sciences where we don't have the same amount of funds and we, we have quite a lot of tendency push now towards using other people's data. So it's a very important area of open social science and yet it creates lots of issues because data that's been designed for one particular purpose, uh, you know, can be quite tricky to adapt or shape towards a, a, a second kind of purpose. So we'll be 
focusing on that, and I think it's particularly helpful for uh, PhD and early career people, you know, who, who don't have the resources to go out and generate their own data, or indeed the rest of us who don't have the resources to go out and generate our own data. So that's November the 10th, and uh, I think um, uh, Kundai is going to circulate the details uh, um, in the chat. Uh, it's there already. Uh, yes, it is. So um, reusing and repurposing secondary data. Um, it's in the chat at just after 12 o'clock. Thank you, every, everybody, for uh, coming to this session. And uh, if anybody has any follow on comments or questions, just please do email us. We're very, very accessible and very keen to get your feedback and your comments. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Bye bye. Cheerio. Bye.